welcome everyone that's joining our webinar today. I think we'll start and those who are joining us a minute or two later can catch up. So for those of you that don't know me, my name is Sarah Corley. I'm the head of community at DFI. And one of my responsibilities is to organize a webinar series. And so I'm very pleased to say today is on a topic that I personally love a lot, um, digital identity. Um, and we're also making it topical by connecting it to what is affecting a lot of, uh, well, pretty much I think everybody around the globe right now, the coronavirus issues. So I'm really pleased that I've been joined by an expert today um, from Caribou Digital. We've got Emrys on the line with us, um, Director of Research. So we know we're going to have a well thought out discussion and presentation today. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us. Um, and if any of you have any questions that you'd like to ask, please, on the bottom of your screen in the little menu that'll pop up, you'll see a function called Q&A. You can pop your questions in there, and after um, the presentation has finished, we'll get round to trying to answer as many questions as we can before our time ends um, on the hour today. Um, just a reminder as well, we're recording today's session, so if you do happen to have to drop off, or you really enjoyed it and want to share it with colleagues, You'll be getting an email with a link to the recording, hopefully in your inbox tomorrow. Um, so feel free to share as well. So I'm going to hand over now to our expert for today's session. So over to you, Emrys. Thank you, Sarah. And hello, everybody. Um, good, good, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. For me, it's good afternoon. I'm in Jordan in uh, Amman. And uh, it's, it's very much a very warm afternoon. So if, uh, if you see me sweating, it's not because uh, the pressure is growing, it's because the heat outside is, is, is growing. Um, as Sarah mentioned, I'm uh, going to share some thoughts on our research in digital identity, some of the insights, the, the lessons that we've learned, and what some of them might mean for a response to COVID-19. Um, I'm just going to give you a very brief overview of, uh, of Caribou Digital, who we are, to frame what our approach is and our um, insights, and then go through some of the things that I'm going to share with you. Now, I just need to share my screen, which should come up. Has that come up for everybody? Is that there? Can is that showing now, Sarah? It is. Yes, everyone can right. see. You can see, and everyone oh, else should be able to see. Yes, we've had confirmation from Salman. Thank you. He's saying he can see. Very good. Thank you, Salman. You never know what it looks like on your screen if it's the same. <laughs> Same on somebody else's screen. And of course, perhaps that's one of the central themes of identity as well, knowing what other people know. <laughs> So, exactly. who are we? Caribou Digital is a, we're a small boutique consulting firm. Our work focuses around building ethical digital economies. And we do that through four streams of work. The user research, which is my, my main area. And here our focus really is spending time with individuals, getting to understand people's everyday uses of digital technology, and the impact it has on their lives. We believe that that's a critical part of really thinking through how to best make sure that these technologies, this digital transformation, is the best and delivers the most optimal outcomes for everybody. But we also recognize, of course, that no man is an island, that individuals alone are not sufficient to understand the implications, the way that the digital transformation is unfolding. So we also have a strong focus on ecosystems research, and that's a, a big focus in the identification work that we do, and I'll talk more about that, but also in the financial services work, the um, other areas of our, our work, including things like space technologies and so on. Having this holistic approach is something that we feel is really important, understanding how the whole piece fits together. The insights from that we use to inform our technical assistance, which we give to governments, to uh, donors, to foundations, to organizations, the private sector, and in a variety of ways. That might be direct, re through research publications, etc. And finally, we also do impact measurement, looking at how the 
outcomes of the interventions that we're advising on, that others are doing, understanding how those are impacting individuals and also that wider ecosystem. So that's very much who we are. We're a global organization based um, across three or four continents, um, but virtual, we don't have an office, which has meant that the corona crisis, the stay at home trend for most of us has been um, not unusual, but nonetheless, of course, it's, uh, we're, we're all working within a, a new context. So our kind of clients that we work with are, as I mentioned, governments, uh, international organizations like the UN, the World Bank, private foundations, and of course, increasingly things like the UK Space Agency, European Space Agency, and private sector organizations as well. So today, what I'd like to talk through with you is to share three things that we've learned in our approach to digital identification research and work. And from those three insights, those three approaches, insights that might be helpful to inform thinking about responses for COVID-19. And the three things that I'm going to share that we've learned, the first one, the importance of ecosystems, as I mentioned, the idea of identity as relationships, and some methods to research identification technologies. The insights I'm going to share, which will draw on that, will be the importance of clarity of value to organizations and individuals, the importance of preventing mission creep, uh, the possibilities for predicting vulnerability from identification systems, and following through from that, designing for protection. And I'll go into all of these in more detail. So the first insight, the, what, what have we learned? This image of uh, Kenya's identification e ecosystem is part of our broader work in this area. And it comes out of recognition that many, if not most approaches to identification systems focus on a single system. Of your driving license, it could be a national identification system, etc. But while most approaches focus on one system, the reality is that none of these exist in isolation. And looking at a single system, just looking at, let's say, a driving license or a national ID card, can exclude the consideration and understanding of the implications of dependencies, of certain impacts, and the outcomes from their use. So it's really important to take this ecosystems approach in order to have a real understanding of how these systems function in real life. And so we found it really helpful to look at identification systems in context. And we use a phrase called the national identification ecosystem. Now, much like David Porteous and DFI's work on financial technology ecosystems, this is a zooming out, it's a way of trying to think about the whole picture to understand how these technologies, this central part of digital transformation, is affecting people's lives. So what do we mean by a national identification ecosystem? Well, it includes the interdependencies and interests of technical, organizational, political, and human relationships that underpin identification systems. So we consider not just identification systems and their interrelationships, for example, how one credential depends on another breeder credential in order to access it, but also the legal and regulatory frameworks that govern their use and the political context from which systems and law emerge and the social norms that shape how people engage with these systems, for example, around issues like privacy, which vary widely across the world. So we've begun from the premise that individual systems such as, for example, those that issue birth certificates, maybe, national identity documents, cannot be considered in isolation or separate from the power and the politics that surround them. Now, what's the value of this? What does it actually do? What's the point? Well, an ecosystems approach can help reveal and support understanding of the existing patterns of power, politics, and social norms. And this is helpful because it provides insights that point to the effects of identity systems, guiding the design, implementation, to ensure good outcomes and to mitigate against bad ones. So as an example, I am showing you and sharing this image from our work in Kenya. And this is an interactive map and it shows a, a description of all the different components of the 
uh, identification ecosystem. Now, if I can, Joel, click through, this is obviously a slide, but I'm going to click through to the actual map. This is online. There's a link in the presentation which you will be able to share. So, for example, our map shows, and this is all in interactive, you can move it around, and if we click on one, you can see up here that there's the different components and a description of them, the in-depth detail of the background and legal mandates, things like that. But the map is also interactive. So, for example, if we click on digital credit, it isolates all the different components in the ecosystem that are relevant for that particular element within the map. So, for example, this, uh, this element, I'm clicking on digital credit, it, it illustrates how it's connected to the credit reference bureaus, to mobile operators, the mobile banking system governed by the Central Bank of Kenya, the integrated population in re registration system. And what it also shows when we go deeper here into the di digital credit system, the mapping shows that the bank that the digital credit systems rely on, that the, the bank that um, Safaricom partners with for M-Pesa is, is largely owned by the ruling Kenyatta family and other political elites. And this gives rise to some analysis, which, for example, could suggest that perhaps there are certain incentives at play, interests at play for governments loosening the mobile money and credit regulations which have recently taken place. So an ecosystems approach can unpack the power and politics as well as the broader connections and relationships in an identification ecosystem, as well as revealing the dependencies and some of the ways in which different systems might come used. I'll come back to this later to show how it affects vulnerabilities as well. So no identification system exists in isolation and an national identity ecosystem approach can help address that and show the way through. The second insight, identity is not a thing. Now, many people, either when we, when we talk about digital identity, either talk about personal identity, you know, it's Emrys, I'm English, I'm married, I have a new son. These are core parts of who I am, but it's not a thing. Those are all relationships. Similarly, when we talk about technologies, many approaches to digital identity focus on the technology itself, on the credentialing, or sometimes even on the designation, the status that the system grants. So for example, they might focus on biometric or blockchain technology, whether the national ID credential is a card or a number, or what the status recognized by the ID credentials enables, maybe bringing access to rights, services, or being excluded from them as well sometimes. And these are important questions, but we found that like thinking on one system, thinking of ID as a single static thing has limitations. Instead, we think of identity as a relational property that exists between parties. Parties whose relationships are shaped by existing power, politics and norms. And for example, having a driving license is only useful when someone trusts the credential that it proves who you are and importantly, what you are, that you can drive. Or maybe a citizen of a particular location, a resident somewhere, and of course, someone qualified to drive. The relationships in which that functions may also adapt and use those credentials in different ways. For example, who's ever used a driving license as proof of age or a residence in a particular place, even though the credential isn't designed to do that? So thinking about identity as not being a thing is helpful because if we understand who the parties to identification are and the nature of their relationships, we can understand the real life impact of identification systems. So for example, the, the image that I'm sharing in this picture, it's a uh, welfare distribution in Bidi Bidi camp in Uganda. And you can see hopefully how the grain is being distributed and they're using a paper-based system using cards, checking off who's there, who's eligible, who's received certain amounts of grain and beans. But this is despite the camp being the largest camp in the world, largest refugee camp in the world, with one of the most developed approaches to digital services that has recently completed a whole of camp biometric registration, a whole camp. In fact, all refugees in Uganda have been recently re-verified through a biometric registration system. But there's constraints. 
mobile network coverage on which the use of biometric registration systems relies is severely limited. Not all of the camp is covered by mobile signal. And may, as a result, in many places, they have to use paper credentials. These, of course, are easier to forge. They allow people other than the holder to obtain the entitlements, the grain that they're um, lining up to receive. And so the distributing organization, WFP and World Vision, and the individuals have to rely on a greater degree of trust than they do in other parts of the camp. So at the heart of identification as not being a thing is relationships. And at the heart of relationships is issues of power and trust. These dynamics, these elements of identification systems in practice and the intangibles that I've been talking about, trust and power, are, are difficult to research. They're not immediately observable. So we've been trying and working through ways in which that can actually function in practice. And that's the third lesson that I'd like to share with you, which is making the invisible visible. And so it's all very well, as I said, arguing that digital ID is best thought of as relationships, but that makes it harder to study, understand and engage with. So we found it helpful to adopt what we call a transaction lens, which may be familiar to some of those, to some of you who have experience of work around user journeys or user pathways. And a transaction lens takes the idea that digital identification is always a relationship. The person who issues the card, and the person who receives the card, another party maybe who relies on the card. And so in the image that I'm sharing, you see a, um, an image of a, a woman, a female refugee in Lebanon, who's accessing a, she's in a shop and obtaining her, um, uh, the goods that she's entitled to, which she proves that she's eligible for through a thumb-based um, biometric registration as a man on the side. And in this, we've sought to show how in this transaction, and this image comes from a photograph, which comes from an observation of this taking place, time that we spent in the shop, that in the, in the transaction that takes place, we can observe the broader dynamics in which digital identification takes place. Now, this clicks through to another illustration, and I'm going to show that to you now because it illustrates how we approach these different transactions. And so for example, here, we can click on this. And again, this is online. The links will be shared with you afterwards. Um, and you can see in the text how it's an illustration of the issues that are going through this woman's mind. She's concerned about this man taking her biometrics, that he doesn't trust that necessarily she's the person she says she is. And she says, I wish we could use cash instead of a card. Issues of trust, of respect come out to play here quite strongly. Similarly for the man, a st similar story, how this identification transaction takes place. Concern around whether he trusts the system, whether it's really her, is she really pregnant? Are these scanners really reliable? They don't always work, etc. So this becomes a way of telling the story of a particular transaction. And we can move through it like this and describe then that transaction in narrative form. And this transaction story becomes a way of telling and describing how identification systems work in practice. So, and I'll share the link with you afterwards. There's a number of stories here that if you're interested, you can look through. So what does this actually tell us? Well, for example, this transaction approach, when we applied it in Uganda, in Bidi Bidi Camp again, revealed how women often flee uh, before their partners and are registered as heads of household by UNHCR. And as such, they're given the rights to make decisions about the kind of goods that they have, what they do with them, how they allocate them. Maybe they even sell them. And this gives them control over resources which in, for many of the people we spoke to was the first time coming from very patriarchal male led households, the first time that the women we spoke to were able to make these kinds of decisions. But then when their partners subsequently arrived, they would demand the control that they were used to. And this we found and we heard was the biggest cause of domestic violence. And these 
this transaction approach allows us to see these invisible dynamics at play by observing a transaction, by speaking to the parties to it, understanding the details of the way the identification system functions, right down to who registers, who's registered, the status that that gives them, we can see some of the outcomes, the implications of these systems in practice. So these are three insights, three lessons that we've learned and ways in which we can actually explore questions around digital identity. So what are the lessons, what are the insights that, that these approaches have been able to generate for us? Well, the first, of course, and you might expect me to say this as a researcher, is that research is critical and that qualitative in-depth research is really important. And here, this, this image of a, a colleague of mine and uh, in Lebanon's Becker Valley is an example of hours that we would spend with individuals, sometimes longer, to understand how these technologies, how these systems are playing out and how people experience them. So, four insights. The first insight. The first is the importance of being clear about benefits. And here, two images. You'll notice that I'm sharing a lot of images of identification from refugee context. And that's because we're just coming out of a large piece of work on identification for refugees um, for DFID as well as supporting UNHCR in their work there. But these principles apply more broadly, I think, and I'd be interested to hear whether they resonate with you. So being clear about the benefits, what does that mean? Well, institutions can gain um, value, benefits, for example, through reducing fraud, making targeting more efficient, generating more data. And these benefits, and the image on the, on the left here, on my left, is of a shop front where you can see WFP signers outside, and the shop owner has partnered with WFP to sell goods through the ration system that WFP has, has partnered with. And the, the, the benefits here are obvious, because, and they're obvious because I guess most ID systems are designed by institutions for institutions' needs for the management, the organizing of relationships with individuals, etc. And this has allowed the shop owner to be confident about reducing fraud, about managing stock better, about ensuring that payments are actually going to be made. But in this designing for institutions, and most systems are designed for institutions, people are often forgotten. In fact, when we were conducting research on Adhar, India's national ID system, a number of years ago, we asked the designers about how whether they'd consulted with users to make sure it worked well for them. And they replied, yes, of course we have. We spoke to many government departments. And the point here is that users are often seen by the designers of these systems as organizations, not as the individuals who come to use them on an everyday basis. And the truth is people themselves don't really value identification systems in and of themselves. They value the services or the entitlements or the rights that the credentials reflect eligibility for. And this is an example again of how we find thinking of ID not as a thing, but rather as a relationship, as a um, situated in an ecosystem as being helpful. Because it's the, relation, it's the relationships that these credentials reflect and what's granted, given, entitled, sought for in those relationships. Nonetheless, people do describe particular kinds of value in the way the system is actually designed. For example, and this is the description of the young man on the right hand side, you can see there's a number of credentials in front of him. Um, he's showing the different cards that he would use to obtain benefits and rations. And there's a number of them. He was obviously frustrated having to carry around so many. The blue one on the left that you can just about maybe make out the MasterCard logo reflects an effort by some of the big aid agencies to consolidate support into a single card so they can distribute resources using one credential. And indeed, many of the people that we've spoken to often say they like IDs that do bring together multiple credentials into one. Certainly people we spoke to in um, India valued that around Adhar, the fact that it was used to access multiple services. But they also value, let's say, the legitimacy that an officially recognized credential can demonstrate, for example, to law enforcement, to ward off any harassment or, or to show that they're entitled to be somewhere. 
or for entitlements from the ability to access work. And my colleagues, Savita and Helene, have a really in-depth work on our website showing how identification systems enable access to work, particularly for women. As well as, of course, for refugee services, as the work that I'm sharing with you demonstrates. Indeed, in Uganda, the, many of the refugees welcomed the biometric ID system because they believed it would lead to a more equitable distribution of goods because it would stop the kind of fraud that they knew was happening, the kind of fraud where they or their friends would, would rent their children in order to increase the family size when they were registering in order to obtain a larger allocation of uh, resources. So people value benefits for particular reasons. But the lesson is it's really important to identify the specific needs and the specific benefits that these systems allow. And that comes from understanding the use cases that these systems can be used in for both organizations and individuals in order to ensure that they deliver value. And that that value is understood by designers, by managers, and of course, users as well. In order to support a system to engage with it, people have to trust it and believe that it will deliver value. And critically, because these systems involve personal data, personally identifiable information, data protection and privacy protections are critical. And yet many of the people that we've spoken to are not really aware of the privacy considerations. They're not aware of where their data goes, who has access to it, who might share it, which makes paying attention to them all the more important. And so what's the lesson for COVID-19 responses here? Well, for social protection systems, which are used to distribute benefits to populations, increasingly as part of state support to, the, to economies which are under great stress, it's critical to ensure that they deliver value, that they're inclusive and, up, and importantly, uphold data protection and privacy. We're just completing some work for DFID looking at social protection systems and ID systems. And we've outlined the, a data protection regime that organizations could be um, encouraged to follow and be regulated by. And it's critical that these, these um, data protection regimes are put in place in order to ensure that these systems are safe as well as delivering the value that people need. So the second insight. <coughs> Excuse me. The second insight is the importance of preventing mission creep and maintaining accountability. And this image of um, people in Northeast India protesting against changes to the Citizen Amendment Bill reflect why this is so important and I'll come to it. The thing is that different ID systems have different functions. They embody different kinds of relationships as I've been talking about. And systems are usually designed for specific purposes. And there's a big difference between them. For example, between foundational systems, such as birth certificates and national ID cards, that embody a relationship between citizen and state and reflect a recognition of status by the state of individuals of their entitlement to citizenship or residency. And on the other hand, functional systems that are designed for specific and limited purposes, a driving license, for example, although as we've talked about, can be used for different purposes, but also health cards and refugee credentials have narrowly defined uses and applications. And these reflect much more limited relationships and status. Now function creep describes when systems designed for a specific function start being used for other purposes and as a result can lead to many problems particularly around exclusion. And this comes to the example that's illustrated in the image. For example in uh, Adhar in northeast India the image here shows a protest about citizenship registration which is contentious in northeast India in Assam because of the porous border with Bangladesh, where people routinely carry around copies of the 1971 census in order to show that their family was, president, was present then and so are legally Indian citizens. What does this have to do with Adhar? The system that's designed to distribute government welfare services and goods? Well, Adhar was originally a functional system intended to be voluntary and intended to be for very particular uses but has now become ubiquitous and almost mandatory to access nearly all government and state services. As a result, because of this almost synonymous implication between being a citizen and the rights that you're entitled to, Adhar registration was stopped in Assam 
to prevent non-citizens registering for state services. And as a result, we found people in northeastern India were excluded from being able to access critical services and the kind of benefits that they were legally entitled to. Now, managing and limiting function creep requires holding institutions accountable. And this reflects the importance, again, of understanding the political economy of an ecosystem. Systems are manifestations of power, as I mentioned, and so understanding where this power lies and how it operates is really important. For example, in both India and Kenya, civil society activists protesting against Adhar and against the Kenyan national ID system, Huduma number, were able to mobilize and engage through the judicial system and appeal to the constitution in order to limit the function creep and introduce protections to both Adhar and the Huduma number. And the lesson here is that function creep often causes problems, especially when it doesn't include the most vulnerable or edge case populations in original planning and design. So we've learned that being able to hold system providers accountable to their original intent is vital if we're going to uphold individual rights and protect individuals from abuse. And the lesson here for COVID-19 responses is that systems such as contact tracing apps, which prompt fears about persistent surveillance, function creep beyond the initial use, are going to need to be regulated by transparency and accountability for their intended use, how that data is used, and when that use will come to an end. These systems must be covered by rigorous data protection and privacy laws, or by dedicated legislation designed to cover its use and also to mandate the end of its application. The third insight is that politics predicts vulnerability. And in this image, as you can see, I've zoomed in on the national identification ecosystem in Kenya and illustrated how the National Integrated Identity Management System and the National Registration Bureau are linked to the Nubian Rights Forum, Forum the Kenyan ICT Action Network. And this is particularly in relation to issues of vulnerability. So why is this important? Well, identification systems as we know, and I'm sure you're aware, are a central part of digital transformation. The Pathways to Prosperity Commission at Oxford University, which looks at how digital technologies and transformation lead to economic growth, describes digital ID as one of the foundational systems required for our pathway to a digital future. So they're central and they're going to be ever more pervasive. And Yet ID systems are a part of a wider context. They're inseparable from the digital ecosystem in which they exist. And as part of any transformation, they are shaped by the political economy of any context. And understanding this is critical to anticipating the impact of this aspect of digital transformation, particularly for the most vulnerable. So here existing political economy analysis tools can help show where power and the interests of the powerful lie and which groups are already vulnerable. Any digital transformation is more likely to amplify than disrupt the existing political settlement. So, for example, our ID ecosystem work, our ID ecosystem mapping work in Kenya helps describe the national ID ecosystem and reveal the political economy to anticipate risks and vulnerabilities for specific groups. And in Kenya, for example, it reveals the interests of those most vulnerable. And here, this zooming in shows how the Nubian, right, the Nubian community already marginalized in Kenya was further at risk of being marginalized through their, the challenge they faced in getting access to identity credentials because of their contested legal status by the state. As a, as a result of this, advocacy by the excluded Nubian community, the Nubian Rights Forum particularly, was a central part of the civil society response to the Kenyan government efforts around Huduma number. So what's the lesson here for COVID-19 responses? Well, for systems such as immunity certificates, to get people mobile and back to work going to be critical, almost, almost inevitable that they will become a part of how the transition out of lockdown for many countries takes place, for better or worse. But as these are rolled out, we've learned how important it is to make power and its operation transparent and incorporate what it reveals into planning. So for example, it seems already with COVID-19 that the poor and minority communities are already hit hardest 
by the virus. So it's important to ask and to map how and in what ways who immunity passports benefit most and who might be most excluded and as a result, even more vulnerable. The fourth and final insight is the importance as a result of these three insights that preceded it of designing for protection. Now ID systems are often designed for usability or for enrollment. How to get as many people to use them as possible and indeed identification systems have to work for the entire population of intended users or they should do. But in many cases systems are designed for the majority not for everybody. And for example many ID systems are piloted on refugees to show how complex technology such as iris recognition can work in difficult contexts and indeed the provider of the iris recognition system in Jordan has used their use in this difficult context as a marketing pitch saying if it can work here it can work anywhere but we've seen how the innovative use of ID credentials can cause harms in this image that I'm sharing a community loans officer in India holds the hand of a female borrower to help the biometric scanner recognize her thumbprints. And there's two points here. Firstly, in many places, a man touching a woman unasked for, unrequested, is a breach of social norms, potentially bringing shame to the family. And that's something that's gonna play out for many of the uh, cash out elements of COVID responses where cash distribution is a big part of it, that physical contact is going to be an issue. Secondly, this example that I'm sharing with you shows that biometric systems often exclude people whose fingerprints are worn, particularly the elderly and family members, the elderly and manual laborers. And so we've learned that it's vital to design systems to protect against vulnerabilities. First, before focusing on usability, it's important to focus on the vulnerability first. And this requires identifying those vulnerabilities as a first step before even designing a system. And then again, taking those insights into a protection first approach in both design, implementation and use. So the lesson here for COVID responses is for all ID based systems, whether that's contract tracing, immunity passports or credentials used to access vital services, we must identify the edge cases. And particularly as it looks, there's a growing trend towards facial recognition, understanding how this is going to further impact and possibly exclude minority communities where we know that facial recognition systems trained on white, predominantly on white faces, often exclude, fail to recognize non-white faces. So any system that relies on technologies which are not inclusive of all communities using them is going to lead to further exclusion, further harms, and not the kind of results that they're intended for. I realize I'm, I'm, I'm running close to time, so I'm gonna stop there with the fourth and final insight and say thank you and uh, open for questions. Perfect. Thank you very much for those insights. Very, in, very useful information and, and also connecting it through to uh, the COVID crisis as well. So thanks for that. Um, and I can see we've already had quite a few questions coming in. So let's, let's start there. Um, and we'll start with a question from um, Maxime. Maxime has asked, um, Identification should be considered in an, an ecosystem approach, putting emphasis on the importance of relationships. Um, he understands we, you know, to build good identity, we may need a lot of data. Um, can we build good ID without data specialists or data science in scientists? You know, what kind of role do they have in the ID process? That's a great question, Maxine, and thank you for bearing with me. I, I think the data scientists and data specialists are critical to how identification systems are used and also to the kind of value that can be generated by ID systems. And that one of the appeals of ID systems, and it was very controversial around the UK's um, contact tracing app where it's partnered with a, a data, an American data firm Palantir, real concerns among some parties that the data that these systems are used would be mined, extracted for other purposes. And so one of the concerns that these systems raise is the fact that such sensitive personal data is collected, stored, lays them vulnerable to being exploited and misused. And that's why I've been emphasizing the importance of data protection, privacy regulations, etc. 
And in order to design systems that can uphold them, we need data professionals, data scientists, who can maintain and uphold them in ways that work and function well. Maintaining that privacy and like you say, you know, not, not creeping from the use. So if we've signed up to use an app for coronavirus, then knowing that our data can still be accessible past the pandemic is, is really something um, I think we're probably more aware of as well, thanks to the Facebook and Cambridge Analytica kind of scandals around the misuse of data too. Um, I know in, in Africa, not all of our, our countries have sufficient you know, regulations when it comes to data protection and privacy. And, and this is also, you know, coming back to Maxime's question. So can you maybe give us as a, examples of countries that do have good um, regulations so that those of us who, you know, can go and do a little bit of research about them? Absolutely. Great question. Uh, regulations are critical and ensuring that a data protection regime is well designed and based on local context and needs is really important. Um, but I'd say two things. Firstly, as a reference point, the, the gold standard globally is GDPR in Europe. And this is incredibly um, well developed. It's been based on extensive research consultation and has become a template that other contexts, other countries have almost transposed um, wholesale as the basis for their own data protection rate regime. And on the one hand, that's great, you know, that introduces a gold standard and it's very robust. Um, but it also is problematic. It's designed for a European context, for a European market, and based around European considerations of politics, of, it, of the economy, and of social norms like privacy. In other contexts where they're beginning to use GDPR or as a reference point, for example, we are running some workshops and discussions in Southeast Asia. And we heard how the idea of privacy in a number of countries there was very different. And so there's a real important, there's a real issue in looking to an existing template and copying it and use against using it as a reference point and developing a data protection regime that's bespoke and suited to local context and understandings. And the second point is I think that even where data protection regimes are well designed, are put in place, are suited to the local context, the reality is that they're only going to be as good as the rule of law to uphold them. And in many countries, the rule of law is frequently flouted. And so even if the law is good, power just rides roughshod over it. And so there's a really important work being done that's linked to our ecosystem research by colleagues at um, the School of Oriental African Studies looking at the political economy of data protection and identification systems. And this is already a very useful way of thinking about where the rule of law is strong versus the rule of law is weak and the implications for the way data is managed and protected. And it's not, a, it's not an issue that's going to go away anytime soon. So, I mean, really and truly, in order for us to digitalize, which is what we're all needing to do and, and situations like you know the COVID-19 pushes us maybe even faster into the, the need and the reasons behind digitalization and obviously there are many others too and this isn't going to go this isn't going to go the need to find an ID system that can that can work in a digital world is going to be important and so we can see that countries like Kenya and India right, have made good and bad and you know roads into that um, are there any other good examples of, of um, other good ID systems out there that you can tell us about? It's a really good question. And we were um, part of some, some work which the Amidiar Network, who does a lot of work in this, in this space, were conducting, trying to identify and think through what good ID systems could look like. Um, the truth is, I don't believe there is a single definition of what good looks like. It's going to vary according to context, according to use, according to need and, and, and so on. However, I think that systems which are, um, which prioritize data protection, which minimize data collection, and which are not centralized, are far more likely to uphold the interests of individuals, rights to privacy, data protection, etc 
than others. And so, for example, um, places like um, uh, Canada's Pan-Canadian Trust Framework is taking a very decentralized approach where the standards, the, the requirements for the way data is collected and stored and managed is defined and the minimum data that's required in order to identify someone is determined. But the system, the technology is not determined and there's no central repository of data that can be held, which makes it very, which would make it very vulnerable to attack. Um, in Thailand, for example, there's also very interesting work being done there to develop an identification system that's also quite decentralized, that relies on a trust framework and enables people to prove who they are without necessarily having to share as much information as they would in a centralized system. And there's, there's two emerging technologies which are, or innovations if you like, which are I think worth following, which might offer opportunities in this area. The first is um, cryptographic encryption of um, personal data. So if you like a hash of my, my ID, which could be used and circulated within the context where I need to prove I, am, prove I am, but the hash doesn't actually reveal anything about who I am. It's just tested against the original hash, the original in, in encryption. The other innovation, which also comes out of the cryptographic community is something called zero knowledge proofs. And this would be, for example, where um, I might say to my doctor, I, you know, I'm entitled to use a health service in the NHS. We have a free health service. Um, and I'm entitled to use this, this particular service. And the doctor would simply say, he would check that I'm registered and that I'm entitled, but he wouldn't necessarily know my full family history or details that are held in my medical records. And so this zero knowledge proof where your eligibility is authenticated, but the knowledge, the data behind that eligibility is not shared, is a way of minimizing data sharing and making that more vulnerable. So there's a number of places where I think innovations are happening. And there's a number of innovations themselves technically which are worth following. So it's kind of putting the, the user back in control of their information and like, like for example, I'm thinking when you know when I was younger and I that you know maybe I was going to buy myself a bottle of wine when I was 19 I'd have to show my my passport to to be able to do that to prove that I'm over 80 but it's got all sorts of other information about me that nobody actually needed to see to know my exact date of birth, you know, none of that was necessarily needed. So this is about technology that's putting me in control that only just says, show this person that I'm eligible to buy this bottle of wine, nothing more about me, and um, puts me back in the user seat um, and, and control of how my data is used. Is, am I understanding you correctly there? Absolutely. Although I also think there's a tension between wanting to give individuals control over how their data is used and the burden of responsibility that individuals then have to take in order to make sure their data is being used in the right way. I know that I struggle to manage the cards, the bank cards that I have, let alone all of the passwords. <laughs> the password, it, 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 it's like a very good example. But, and I think there's a risk that if we go too far or go in the wrong, go about giving individuals control in the wrong way, will give them too much responsibility. And there's emerging, again, ideas in this area that are trying to find ways through this. Ideas, for example, around data trusts, data guardians, people that you might nominate who would be um, trusted by yourself and trusted by a relying party who's, who's wanting to authenticate what you're saying or claiming, um, who would then take on that burden for you. And I think we're going to see more innovation in this area but I think the tension and the challenge is going to be ways in which that principal desire for individual um, control for the maintenance of privacy and protection of data on the one hand against the interests of other parties to exploit, to derive value from that data. And again, there's legitimate reasons for that, for example, too. Um, the debate in the contact tracing, um, in the debate around contact tracing apps is largely between centralized and decentralized approaches. Apple and Google have these decentralized approaches, which is perhaps putting privacy first, and that's really helpful. The argument for a centralized approach, which is what the UK government has done, 
almost in isolation from any other country, is that it will allow the health service more insight into where this virus is spreading, who's uh, vulnerable, and give them more data to respond better. And that tension is a real one. And the, the, the challenge I think going forward is going to be for the principles and the functionality to align and for the interest of both to be met. But it will be an ongoing tension, I think. And if you like, perhaps at its heart, it's emblematic of the ongoing tension of between the individual and the state, between individuals who have limited power and institutions, the state, but also large organizations who have their own interests at heart. And, and each person has their own different trust levels in their state, whether they are very proud and, you know, and are happy for their data to be held and used in, in the appropriate ways or other people in other countries maybe belonging to certain vulnerable groups or not, or just, just not generally that, you know, the, the trust level is different. And I think that the trust aspect is really important as you've, as you've said. Um, you also reminded me of, you know, when we often sign up to things, we have all these long terms and conditions and there's a box to tick at the end. And frankly, who ever reads those things? Most people just scroll down through to tick the box. And I think that's important to, you know, why we need these data guardians, because A, you know, we don't always have the, the, the time, the ability um, to understand what it is, or, you know, or the inclination to cite you notes. Know, I mean, how many of us have Facebook accounts that we, we haven't secured, yet the options do exist to some extent to secure our data within a platform like that. And we don't always take, you know, maybe it's, we're not informed, maybe we just, you know, don't know how to use it. So putting the responsibility completely back on the individual, you know, it is not fair either in, in these scenarios. I like the idea of this data guardian um, that you spoke about. Yeah, it's a very rapidly evolving field. Sorry, I think you're about to choose a... No, go for it. I'd like, I'd like to know just a little more about that. That was what I was going to ask. Can you tell us a little more about what data guardian would, who, who they might be? Well, this is very much uh, a, a live subject. And there's some who believe that this is a whole new marketplace, a whole new economy. Um, that there might be people who might pay to manage our data to be responsible or that people who are looking for that authentication companies uh, service providers etc might be able to um, might be forced to pay a small amount for that but the, the the challenge is establishing those institutions establishing a whole ecosystem again in which this can take place and i think finding the right parties, the right institutions for that is going to be a, a big challenge going, going forward. Um, and of course, at the heart of it is, is trust. And there are uh, real challenges to resolving that, particularly as, as the trust question becomes bigger, people's concerns about it grow. And actually what we're trying to solve for is not trust, but actually distrust. And this is the big challenge, I think, in, in this area. So going back to the concept of biometrics, we've got a couple of people asking questions about biometrics. Um, yeah. Some are interested that their country is, is you know, beginning to introduce biometric ID systems. How can, it, how can it be made more inclusive and more respectful of data privacy? Biometrics are really complicated, I think. Um, there's a very strong argument that uh, they shouldn't be used at all because the data that they collect, unlike let's say my name or where I live or other parts of my identity, um, they're immutable. There's no way I can change them. And so once that information, that identifying data about me is, is taken, I will always be subject to that. I'll always be vulnerable to being identified. I won't have any control anymore. And so there's real concerns about biometric based identification systems. Those concerns are amplified exponentially when people talk about putting biometric um, identifiers on the blockchain, on blockchain based identification systems. And I'm sure, um, I'm sure you know, and many, many people taking part in, and listening know that biometric 
data that, that uh, data stored on a on a blockchain or decentralized system, federated system like that, um, is immutable, and is there forever. That's the whole point. It's stored on multiple um, computers, multiple uh, servers, and it's impossible to to remove. So, the idea of putting immutable, personally identifiable data on an immutable storage system is massively problematic. And I think that this is where uh, the arguments around limiting biometric collection is, is, is really strong. On the other hand, there's uh, very strong arguments for the use of biometric uh, verification, particularly where, let's say, and the refugee example is often given, um, people who arrive who don't have any way of proving themselves need to be able to prove that they are authentic. They need to be able to prove that they are who they say they are, that they are a unique individual. And that, and this is one of the strongest ways of being able to do that. Um, so, and there are, you know, there's, there's um, very big systems now built up around this, uh, UNHCR, WFP, others, even within um, countries like the, like the UK, the US, and increasingly at borders when you come through, it's a facial recognition scan against the photo in your passport or on a centralized database. So facial recognition also is growing massively. But I think this tension is going to endure, even if the debate becomes somewhat sidelined. It's hard to see, I think, being pragmatic. Um, we might like for biometric systems to be rolled back and be replaced by something else, but that's very unlikely, I think. So we need to find ways of mitigating their misuse and ensuring that biometric data is collected in a way that's transparent and accountable, and that the parties that collect and manage that data are also held accountable to the ways that that data is supposed to be managed and used. And I know that there are different types of biometric, whether it's iris, fingerprints, there, there's not just one particular solution. So I guess if we're looking at people with no fingerprints, there are other facial recognition, iris scanning that you could, you know, if you have a, a system that recognizes more than one or stores more than one type of biometric, that will help with making it more inclusive. Yes, yeah, ab ab absolutely. I think um, there is a move increasingly towards um, iris recognition. Um, because of its in greater reliability, the fact that your 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 eye eye pattern doesn't change in the way that a, a thumb pattern might be eroded, for example. Um, but again, you know, these the more data points, the more immutable data that's collected about individuals, the greater the risk of vulnerability. So I think we should, as you're absolutely right, recognise the inclusion possibilities that they offer but also be concerned about the vulnerabilities that they introduce. And my final question, um, we've had a lot, but I know we're not gonna to get to all of them by the end. So we'll try and send useful links. A lot of people are requesting links for or examples of, so we can, we can send that around with the email of the recording. Um, but we had a few people asking questions specifically about Kenya. So let's, let's finish with Kenya. So um, just why did, Kenya, why did Kenya want to bring in a new ID system? Did they rush it? And what's gonna to happen to the old data? Those are the three questions that we've got. Very good questions. Um, I think the question about why it was introduced is a very good one and it's not entirely clear. Um, I think one argument is that they needed a system that could be, um, that, could, that could enable and be used to manage access to a wide variety of government services and it was felt to be easier to build a new system rather than to develop the old, the, the old IPRS system. So, and that's, you know, there's a legitimate argument for that. The old system um, is built on quite dated um, technologies and systems. Um, that's one argument for why it was undertaken. Others argue that it was undertaken in order to give central government greater control over identification management and therefore over um, the way people are um, visible, managed, 
um, and even some people are concerned about possible surveillance misuse, etc. Et, et so again, political economy analysis can reveal some of those ten tensions. Um, was it rushed? Um, yeah, I think so. I think there's a general consensus that the the law was rushed through, the bills were passed without sufficient consultation. And indeed, that was one of the pushbacks from the judicial process that the courts ruled there needed to be further consultation, um, et cetera. So again, this comes back to a point that I hope has come through with everything I've been saying so far, which is the importance of research and the importance of really engaging with understanding, particularly the everyday experience of individuals who will be using these systems. Um, so I think that that's definitely the case that it was rushed through and um, very quickly and could have benefited and hopefully will benefit from more consultation. Uh, what will happen with the old data? Well, my understanding is the old data will continue to be used. And for example, I think the old data was still used as part of credit referencing and for other purposes to access, I believe, still health data and so on. Um, but I imagine that it will Inevit not inevitably, I imagine it'll probably transition across to the Huduma number, to the, to the new one, much, as, it has, much as, as has been the case in India, where Adhar has replaced many of the um, previously existing credentials that we use to access things like welfare services, et, et cetera. Well, thank you very much for that uh, response about Kenya. And it's been a really great hour with you. Um, it is a tightrope, isn't it, between you know, opening the door to, you know, to enable people to have access to, you know, services and, and aid or whatever it is that they, you know, need and should have access to, but also, you know, not wanting to collect so much data or use that data incorrectly um, and make people even more vulnerable than they perhaps already are. Um, like you say, research, consultation, scope are really important you know, factors that we, that need to be considered you know, when, when bringing in anything that you know, might, can, might really exclude people from accessing parts of services and, uh, that they might need. So it is a tough, not one size fits all, otherwise we'd all be doing that, wouldn't we? <laughs> absolutely, I think that's absolutely right. I mean, the truth is that these systems are only going to increase, whether we like them or we don't. And many people legitimately think we shouldn't have them at all, but they are increasingly going to be the frameworks, the, the rails on which our digital future run. And this is how we're going to operate uh, in an increasingly digital world. Um, and I think you know, that train has left the station, but we don't yet know where we're going to end up. And I think there's still a fight to be had uh, um, a lot of work to be done to make sure that the identification train ends up in a place that is respectful of individual agency and choice and control of individual privacy and isn't um, a dy dystopia of surveillance and data exploitation. Um, the one thing I would just finish on is, and I can see there's a number of questions here around self-sovereign identification and um, decentralized idea and, and so on. And one of the things I would say quite strongly is that there is this push recognizing the dystopian possibilities of identification systems, um, a, a push towards if we can give individuals complete control, we can try and mitigate against those risks. But I think the, the, the challenge there is that if you believe, and I certainly do, that identification is always a relationship. It's never going to be possible for me to say I'm Emerus and everybody has to trust me that I'm Emerus. It's always going to be I, tr I am Emerus and this is how I prove it. And this is how I prove it is going to involve different parties. And so the trust in the relationship is always going to need to be there in some way. And so I think the, the idea of simple self-sovereign, self-assertive identity is a um, a very a, 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 a distraction from the important work that needs to be done to think through how do we manage what is known about us, how do we manage being identified by others in ways that can best protect our agency and, and control. And I think there's, there's important work to be done here around digital wallets, trust frameworks, etc. And this is, I think, the, the issues that are really going to need to be 
you know, engaged with and worked hard on in order to make sure that we end up where we'd like to be and not where we don't. Great, and thank you so much for your time today. I've really enjoyed learning from you and chatting with you. It's been very beneficial and opened my mind as to a bit more about some of the complexities involved. Um, and thank you to the attendees that joined us and posted very difficult <laughs> questions for us to answer. Um, they were really, really interesting to see. Um, and is, I hope we've managed to cover many of your questions. And as I said, we'll share some useful links and guidance um, in, the, in the email that we'll send to you, hopefully tomorrow or, or Friday. Thank Absolute pleasure, Sarah. Everyone. It's been uh, a real um, a pleasure to, to, to share this work, work with you and uh, participants in this webinar. And I am, of course, happy to share the, the presentation with you and the links to the work that was referenced. Um, and of course, um, please do share my contact details so people can contact me directly if that's helpful. Um, more than happy to, to engage di directly as in, uh, as in how that's, that's useful. Wonderful. And I'm hoping we, we also, for those of you who may be not a member, we do have a little digital identity WhatsApp group that we've managed to start recently to share and discuss some of these issues. So I'll also send a link out to that so we can continue this conversation in that group as well. Fantastic. Look forward to that. Wonderful. Have a great day, everyone, and hope to see you in a webinar soon. Take care. Thank you, everybody. Goodbye. Thanks. Bye.